All right. Well, if you will recall, we spent a good amount of our time last week talking about this idea of submission. Specifically, where we talked about submission as it results in the marriage relationship. And if you will recall, Paul addresses both the husbands and the wives uh, in the things that he had to say in chapter 5. And we spent a good deal of our time talking about the responsibilities and the roles uh, that we have as husbands. Uh, and we had begun our conversation in regard to some responsibilities that the wives had. And we had gotten down to the point that we had asked this question, that what if a Christian woman is married to a man who does not fulfill his role as a loving, is it, in loving his wife as himself? Is she released from her responsibility or the role of submission? Uh, we all recognize that this can and does happen. Um, and I believe it's worthwhile to have a conversation and to uh, think about some of the things that are written in Scripture in regard to this matter. Some of the things that we have been taught and we are taught as Christians are difficult. And I believe this is one of those difficult areas that if particularly a woman finds herself in some sort of a uh, marriage relationship where the husband is not fulfilling his role, uh, it can be particularly difficult for her. So let's look at a couple of other things. If we look at 1 Peter verses three and, or chapter 3 and verse 1, similar teaching, once again we pointed out that both Paul and Peter address this idea of submission within the uh, marriage relationship. And this is what Peter had decide, to say. He says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, that they may also be won by the conduct of their wives. Peter adds something here that Paul does not talk about in our passage in Ephesians, and that is the conduct of the wife that if she finds herself in this role, and Peter specifically addresses this when he talks about um, husbands that do not obey the word, and he talks about this role that women have and how they can win their husbands by their conduct. And so I think this points to the idea that even in a situation where perhaps a woman is in a marriage relationship where the husband's not fulfilling his role, it does not release her from uh, her role. And last week at the end of class, after we concluded, Mary, uh, oh, something went wrong there. Uh, Mary brought up the idea of the Timothy. And if we consider some things, we know that Timothy's mother and his grandmother were Jewish, but his father was Greek. So here we have an example in uh, the New Testament of perhaps a situation, much of what we're talking about, where you have a, a believing mom and a uh, husband that is not believing. Now, we don't know much, if anything, about Timothy's father, other than the fact that it says he was a Greek. What we are told, and I think if we recognize the silence of the Scripture, the fact that we're given so much information about his mother and his grandmother probably gives us a clue as to the, the situation that Timothy, his family situation. And it says wonderful things about his grandmother and his, and his mother that they taught Timothy the truth. And they, you know, by their good conduct, you have a young man that played in a very important role in the New Testament. All right. So all of that being said, can we tone that down a little bit? Okay, is that a little better? All right. Um, technology. All right, so as we think about that, the point was made, I believe it was Phil that made the point last week, that this should serve is a tremendous warning to the women who are Christians. Select your mates wisely. 
And that goes both men and women. But the reality of the fact is, is that so many times this teaching is something that if women do not choose carefully their husbands, they can find themselves in this very difficult situation where they're called on to, be, to play a role that is, is very difficult. Um, certainly, as I look out this morning, the vast majority of those ladies in the audience are married. And as I look around, most of you have made very good choices in regard to that. But some of the ladies sitting on this side of the room, be careful, pay attention to, you know, look at the uh, indicators of the person that you're looking to marry. Do they fit into the type of role that is going to be a husband that is going to seriously take his charge um, serious in his way that he treats his wife? All right, let's get into chapter 6. In chapter 6, at the beginning of chapter 6, Paul is going to continue this idea of submission, uh, and he's going to talk about a different rule. Uh, Specifically, he's going to talk about submission as in regards to uh, parents and children, and he's also going to talk about submission in regard to bond servants and masters. And we'll make the point that when we get into that conversation that we have a counterpart today that talks about the uh, employment relationship that most of us find ourselves in the world that we live in today. So first of all, he addresses this idea of submission to parents, uh, and that is children being submissive to parents. And in verse 1, he says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. This is not a new concept that we find within Scripture. There is an awful lot written written in the Old Testament about the relationship that should take place between parents and children. And in that, all those things that are written, it's always abundantly clear that when it comes to children, they are to be in subjection to their parents. In Leviticus 19 and verse 3, it, we're told that children were to revere their parents. In Deuteronomy 27 and verse 16, um, it it basically said those who dishonor their parents are cursed. And in Deuteronomy 21, verses 18 through 21, under the old law, dishonoring one's parents uh, by rebellion was a capital offense. And if you read that passage, it was very clear that those that practice such uh, things were... Uh, to be taken outside the city and stoned because of the rebellion. And we will talk about this more, but let's think about who the audience is that Paul is writing to. There may have been children in the church there at Ephesus, but this does not just relate to little ones. It starts there, but as we will go go on to talk about, Uh, this idea of children revering their parents and honoring their parents uh, goes on well beyond the time that they are uh, little children. I would submit to you that learning to obey our parents is how we first learn to obey God. And if you were to go back into our back classrooms this very morning, you would probably find some lessons that are being taught to the little children of how they are supposed to act towards their parents and how they're supposed to act towards God. But obedience is one of those things that is a learned response. We we talked about that last week. When we have a newborn child, do they come out of the womb understanding what obedience is about? Absolutely not. We have to teach them that concept as parents. And by teaching our little children, our babies, how to obey us, we're laying the fundamental groundwork of how they are supposed to obey God. And hopefully those things will take root with them so that as they grow up, it's a very natural response to them that they are obedient to God. 
it's also a fundamental uh, foundation of society. Uh, learning to obey parents is how we learn to be respectful members of society. And sadly, if you open your eyes and just look around, this is a concept that has been greatly lost in our society. What we have in many regards is a society that is not respectful members of society. We don't obey the, the rules of our, our government. Um, if you were to go into Walmart and you see some kid throwing a raging fit and mom and dad not doing anything about it, don't you think that they're laying the groundwork for when they become adults and they don't like whatever rule you're talking about, whether you're talking about the speed limit, whether you're talking about paying your taxes, whether you're talking about being respectful to the government officials that are over us, you know, they're laying the groundwork to have a lot of rebellious people. And we wonder why we have problems. Why do we have problems with discipline in the classroom in our public schools? It's because they're not getting it at home. And so, once again, these are fundamental principles that are laid forth for us is that you start with children and you train them up correctly. Not only do they become good children to the parents, but they become effective members of society and hopefully they also become uh, believing and respectful people to God. He does qualify this commandment. He says, in the Lord. So based on this qualifier, is there a time and a place that it is appropriate for children not to be obedient to their parents? Well, yes, obviously there is. Just like there are times and situations that it is not appropriate for Christians to be obedient to the government. We have examples of that in the New Testament. We have Peter saying, you choose whether it is right for us to obey men rather than God. God is always first. And that should be the case in the parent-child relationship too. Hopefully we have you know, parents that are rearing their children in such a way that this is a moot point, that that is taught and they understand that. But once again, um, you know, there are situations where children are taught to lie, cheat, steal. Parents send them out to do those things, and that's a sad situation. But we understand that under those circumstances, that when it, a conflict becomes happens between God and between uh, man, that God should always reign superior in that regard. Verses 2 and 3, it says, Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. This is the fourth commandment in the Ten Commandments. And that is exactly, I believe, what Paul is referring to here when he says, this is the first commandment with promise. If you go through those 10 commandments, when you get down to chapter or chapter 20 and verse 12, where you have this quotation about children honoring their mother and father, um, this is a situation that this is an old, old principle that is carried forth into the New Testament and still applies uh, to Christians today. I also find it interesting uh, that this commandment is one of those if-then commandments. For you guys that are computer programmers out there, if-then statements are very, very important. That if this situation happens, then the response or what, needs, what will happen is addressed in the next line of your programming. And this is... These types of commandments are populated widely through the Bible. Uh, there's many of these type of if-then commandments. If you uh, look at 1 Peter 3, verses 10 through 12, he says, He who would love life and see good days, 
If you would love life and see good days, then this is what you do. Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. The principle is there that if you do one thing, this is going to be the fruit that comes from it. And when we're talking about um, children and parents, it talks about the fact that they may, it may be well with you and you may, may live long on the earth. There are blessings that will happen to children that honor their mother and father. Uh, things will go better for them. That's just one of those natural things that will happen in life. When children choose not to be obedient and not to honor their father and mother, in most cases, bad things happen. We have a comment up here with Dick. I don't know if you intend to touch on this or not. The word honor that's there, mm -hmm. um, I think is useful for us to recognize in some way it has a money consideration about it. Um, we want to honor widows who are widows indeed, has a money consideration about it. <clears throat> Consider an elder worthy of double, double honor under circumstances as a money consideration. Um, same, same word that's there in um, Matthew where the priests <clears throat> have received the money back from Judas <clears throat> when he threw it back at them. Um, they had said, um, well, we can't do anything with this because it's the price of blood. The word price there is this same Greek word. Not sure how far to carry all of that, but I think at least it goes to say, uh, children don't be miserly toward your parents. When, when there needs to be some support for them, don't turn your back on that. And Jesus had additional teaching in regard about that, things like Corbin and things of that, that nature. And we will address some of that as, as we move forward. Um, so how does someone honor their father and mother? And we'll touch on some of the things that Dick talked about. Well, honor can be displayed in a number of different ways. Uh, obedience is one of those ways that we honor our mother and father. Just like we honor God when we obey his laws, you know, we respect him in such a way that we hold him in esteem, we subject our will to his, and we are obedient to him in whatever commandment that we're talking about. And the same thing is true when we're talking about uh, parents and children. Obedience is one of the ways that we honor our mother and father. You know, that carries much with it, the same idea of respect, that we hold them in high regard. Um, when we're obedient to them because of the respect that we have for them, it's not necessarily because we're ne necessarily afraid of the consequences. We honor them because we love them and we want to be respectful to them. All of us that have had parents, at some point you're going to observe in your children that they're going to do something that makes you very proud because they did it not because you threatened them or because they knew that there would be a consequence. They did it because they love their parents. And that's one of the ways that we express and we show honor to our parents. Another way that we do that is emulating them in righteousness. You know, if we have godly parents and we follow their example and we live in such a fashion that we emulate that, then we honor our mother and father. Go back to the book of Psalms and the Proverbs and listen to all of the language about, you know, when the writers are there saying, you know, listen to the words of your mother. Listen to the words of your father. It carries with it the idea of not only just hearing it, but following through and obeying them and to emulate the good example that is talked about in those passages. 
Another way that we honor our mother and father is that we appreciate them. And we um, find ways to show that appreciation. Of all of the sins that you can talk about and look at examples throughout the Bible, uh, the sin of ingratitude often met some of the most severe consequences that God dealt out. You know, God has a very low tolerance for this idea of ingratitude. And for those of us that are lucky enough to have godly parents, we should be extraordinarily appreciative of that. And even for children that maybe don't have righteous Christian parents, they should still be appreciative of all of the things that their parents do for them the way that they provide for them, the education that they help them get, you know, the time that they spend with them, all of these things are factors that all children should have in regard to their parents, that there is a deep level of appreciation for them. Another thing that goes with that that is very akin to obedience is accepting their authority. There may be times that particularly as children get a little bit older that whatever mom and dad told them, it may not be right, it may not be wrong. It's one of those matters of judgment. And as a child, if we honor our mother and father, we accept their authority. That this is not a, a yes, no decision. This is not something that is inherently right or wrong, but we accept the authority that our parents have and we are obedient to that. And then we get to this idea talking about what Dick talked about, and that is providing for our, our parents. There comes a time in the cycle of life that children should provide for their parents that as they become aged, perhaps as they become sick, you know, that there is a responsibility that falls on them to provide for their parents. And in doing that, they honor their parents. You know, and Dick talked about the fact that we treat our parents with generosity from a financial standpoint. We should not have any less of an attitude towards our parents that the parent has towards the child that, you know, we do not, none of us as parents have ever wanted to see our children do without. We always want to provide for them in a good manner, that they have the things that they need, the things that make for a good life. And the role is reversed as parents get older that sometimes it is inherent upon the children to provide those things for their mom and dad. Uh, Drew. So back in chapter five, there's this verse about the imitators of God and this theme of how Christ gave himself up for the church and it ties into the marriage relationship. And I think sometimes when we think about God in the father-child relationship, it's easy to think of him obviously as the father. But when we look at what Jesus does as a, a child of Mary, as the son of Mary, Honoring his mother is so ingrained in him that while he's dying on the cross, he looks at John and says, you know, behold your, your mother and hey, woman, behold your son. So in his last dying breath, this principle is so important to Jesus that that's a concern to him as he's dying. So all of these relationships as we're looking to emulate Jesus and tie it back into his example, like this is another one of those where if we want to look like Jesus and act like Jesus, honoring our parents has to be that important to us because it was that important to him. Excellent. Uh, Rob, we have a, oh, Curtis and then, then Rob. You know, I think it's important to understand that this idea of respecting their position and honoring them as parents goes far beyond just the time that you live in their house. Uh, I realize that the relationship changes when a, when a person becomes an adult, uh, but there is a responsibility that parents have to their children. Uh, for example, in the third chapter of 1 Samuel, where uh, Eli is condemned because 
his son sinned and he did not rebuke them. You know, here they're adults, but yet his failure to rebuke them was a reflection on him. And uh, also, we need to understand that, uh, well, for example, well, my dad, he's he's been dead for 15 years, but uh, when he was alive, I didn't agree with him on everything, but he always, because of his position, deserved an honorable uh an honorable list from from me. I had to listen to what he had to say. I had to consider what he said, and I think that was my his his view as my father. Excellent re- way that we show respect to our parents, Rob. Also, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I've only seen it happen once or twice in my lifetime, but. What Dick was talking about in uh, 1 Timothy 5, 3, the next verse basically says, your father and your grandfather, it is your responsibility to show piety, which is a method of paying back, and uh, to requite their parents. In other words, to repay them for all the things that they've done for you. So this commandment is a little bit deeper. Not only is it my responsibility to have taken care of my father, but it was Ryan's responsibility also if I could have meet all of his requirements. Like I said, in my lifetime, I've only seen where basically a guy was old enough to have a parent and a a grandson or grand kids that it, it that they you both groups help take care of him but it's still there and and I agree with we are here today because my dad was an elder 30 years ago here and he asked us to stay and not move we wanted to go somewhere else but we stayed because he asked us it was his, to honor him, we did. And I'm not griping now, but. If we're living right, the way that we should, all of these examples are reflections on how we emulate Christ, how we honor our mother and father. And as we'll point out in just a second, when we do that, we show the world that we walk in the way of Christ. One more comment. I've always been impressed by Genesis, the 18th chapter in discussing Abraham, where Isaac is about to be born, and God says, gives a reason on why he has chosen him, and that is that he may... I know he will command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. God God expressed confidence in Abraham because of the kind of uh, messaging he, he did with and for his children and family. And so the relationship of parent and child is an is a is a connected relationship where God knew Abraham would teach his children and all of his household, and so that was a a, a condition. It, it is apparent to me that of how highly he thought of Abraham's um, decisions and how he would make decisions as a family leader, and I think that's something that every father ought to take to heart. Absolutely. Well, we've already answered the question that I have on the slide in front of me is, does this commandment have an age limit? And the answer is obviously no, um, you know, for based upon all of the comments that, that we've been listening to. How we treat our mom and dad or our parents when they're aged or sick is one of the the best ways 
that we can show the world that we are followers of Christ and that Christ lives in us. Um, how we do that speaks volumes. And if you don't believe me, when you have a loved one that is in some kind of a skilled nursing facility, just listen to the comments that take place when you go see that your parent on a regular basis, you're there for their care, you are involved in their lives. And you will get an awful lot of comments from people observing that this is rare. You'll get comments from the staff that this is rare. So often, and it's such a sad situation that in our society, sometimes when parents get to that point, they're just kind of put away and forgotten and, you know, just become, you know, waiting for a time that they're gone from this earth. And that is particularly sad and certainly not anything that we as Christians should participate in. It should become very obvious. And once again, I'll back up to our initial comments. Who Paul was writing to, these were adult Christians. And the teaching here was just as much for them as it was for the small children. You know, there comes a point many times when you are dealing with very aged parents that the role between parent and child becomes reversed. And that the child has to take on the role of the caregiver. Just as when they were children in diapers, that mom and dad took care of them, they now take care of their parents. And once again, how we approach that, you know, this should not be a burden to us, but this should be something that um, we accept gladly and that we also accept with the patience because sometimes those situations can be very trying to our patients. But then I always think about how many times did you go up to your mom and dad and ask why? You know, and every time they, they tried their best to, to give you an answer. And so this is important teaching, not only for how we behave, but in how we show the world that, that Christ lives in us. Verse 4, he says, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. Why do you think that this is addressed to fathers? Now, the principles apply to both mothers and fathers, but in this passage, it's addressed specifically to fathers. Well, I think there's a, a number of reasons there. Um, I believe this passage speaks to the fact that men should be the leaders in their home. And that fathers, as the head of the family, must take responsibility for how their children are raised. This is not an area that can be abdicated to the mother. It is the father's responsibility to make sure that their children are raised in such a fashion that they are taught the principles of God. Once again, let's back up to the Old Testament to the words that we read in Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and 7. And these words, which I command you today, shall be in your heart. You shall teach them to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit down in the house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. This was a principle that was laid down under the law of Moses, that it was the responsibility to teach our children. And as men, as husbands, and as heads of our family, we cannot relegate this to the wife. It is our responsibility. Now, don't misunderstand. In no way can you undermine the role that a mother has to play in the rearing of children. But it is the father's responsibility to see to it that it is done correctly and that they get everything that they need. Another thing, reason that I believe that this is addressed to fathers is that this is a reminder of um, the fact that gentleness should be something that men practice. And that does not always come easy for all men. You know, I believe this is one of those things in which God created man and woman in a different way that 
women typically are more gentle than men. So this is a reminder when it comes to our children that men, you need to be gentle with your children. You can't run roughshod over them. Um, and sometimes, guys, when it comes to raising your children and rearing your children, you have to rein yourself in a little bit, you know, and sometimes, you know, take better control of yourself. If we want to know how we as human fathers should treat our children, just go back and read the first three chapters of what this book that we've been talking about. Uh, and then turn around and apply those principles to our own children. If we read about all of the blessings that God has bestowed upon us and, and has provided everything for our spiritual goodness, that should be the role that we as fathers demonstrate towards our children that we're going to provide them everything that we can possibly provide them so that they are successful in their uh, obedience to God. So, I think it's appropriate to talk about some of the ways that fathers can provoke their children to wrath. And these, this is just a small list. I think we can all understand that there's lots of ways that we can do this. But I think this kind of covers some of the big ones. You know, first of all is by making unfair, unreasonable demands. Sometimes as fathers, we need to remember they're children. Okay, they're not adults. They're going to act like children. And so we need to remember that, that we don't make demands upon them that is beyond their ability to, to do. You know, another mistake that often happens is that we don't give our children enough praise. That they don't, you know, you can frustrate a child to the point of, why should I bother? I can never do it good enough. I can never make my parents happy. I can never make dad happy. You know, praise goes a long, long ways towards, you know, the reaction that we get from our children. And once again, sometimes as fathers, you know, we, we forget that. Living hypocritically, you know, that's certainly another way that we can frustrate our children when they look at us and they say, well, why should I obey all of these rules and live in a certain fashion when I can look at dad and he's not doing that? You know, you know, once again, as fathers, we have to lead by example. We have to lead in such a way that our children want to emulate us. And if they see us acting hypocritically, do one thing that I say, but not as I do, well, guess what? They're probably going to em emulate that as well. Um, and, you know, that's very frustrating for children because you're sending to them mixed signals, you know, that they don't understand, well, why should I do this if dad doesn't? Um, having higher expectations for our children than we do for ourselves. You know, sometimes we set the bar pretty high for our children. And don't misunderstand, we need to set that bar high because we should have high expectations for what our children should become. But don't set the bar so high that you can't meet it, because if you can't meet it, maybe they can't meet it either. It should be something that they can attain and that they can do. Here, run out of time. <laughs> um, beating down their children. You know, and this can be a physical thing, but it can also be a mental thing. And this kind of gets back to this idea that, you know, if you frustrate your children to the point that they think that they can never be good enough, that they can never do it well enough, that all they ever hear out of your mouth is criticism, you know, and that goes to whether we're talking about sports or we're talking about their schoolwork or whatever it may be, you know, once again, we can mentally beat down our children to the point that we're not building them up. You know, words of encouragement build up. You know, words of criticism oftentimes tear down. And we need to, we need to think about that. And another way that, you know, being impatient and unjust with our children. There are times that as dads and moms that we just get a little impatient with our kids. We get a little frustrated and sometimes we snap, and sometimes we say something that we shouldn't. Sometimes, 
you know, perhaps if discipline is being administered, we are too harsh with that. And that too can frustrate children. Curtis? Mm -hmm. I think there's no mis no accident that uh, the idea of being a father is something that uh, is also used to talk about our Father in heaven. And I think the, the great responsibility that exists with human fathers is the fact that they, uh, if your children grow up thinking they can never please you, it'll be easy for them to think they can never please their heavenly father. If they grow up seeing harsh and unreasonable demands, whether you like it or not, that's the way they're going to see the father in heaven. So we have a great responsibility to make sure that the way that we live and act is consistent with the word of God so that they can have a better view of what God is. Absolutely. Oh. Uh, you had mentioned um, criticism and what that looks like. And I think for me, just I'm, I'm not a parent yet, but I can see like how my dad treated me. And I always thought he did a good job at this because um, I never felt like my dad criticized me, but he corrected me. And sometimes we confuse those things criticism and correction um, my dad never called me why are you so dumb and why'd you do that that to me is criticism but like he would he would offer I mean he, he would be stern and he would be very upfront with me like don't ever do that again or w whatever it was and he would but he would explain it and he'd be very like upfront about it and I think sometimes I see parents in the world where they they criticize their kid for them just not knowing and then that kid feels dumb or whatever um, and not just correcting them because they just don't know you know because so anyways we're about out of time but in regard to all those dis those comments there is a right and a wrong way to do these things discipline is a part of the role of fathers that we should discipline our children there's too much that is written in the pages of the Bible that talk about that you can't let your children live any way that they want to. That is just as much not loving your children as not loving them in a way that you tear them down. So we are out of time. We will pick up there next week. Next week will be our last.